Hey brewers, in this video, we're gonna run through how to make amazing lager by using some sound water chemistry. Let's get brewing. Hey everybody, Hendo here from Rockstar Brewer. Uh, I'm with Ryan Fullerton. Um, and today we're talking about lager and how to make an awesome one. Um, and basically not follow the Ryan Heights kabot <laughs> and do it in a way that sort of modern brewers do and troubleshoot it and that sort of thing. So lagers are really um, uh, interesting style of beer and I really enjoy making them. And the reason why I enjoy making them is that they are a style of beer that requires you to be very attentive and um, you've really got to watch every part of the process because, because you've got such a clean, fresh, crispy boy style of beer, there's really nowhere to hide. It'll, it'll show all your faults straight away. So how you doing, Ryan? Yeah, doing well, mate. Cheers. It's good. Um, <laughs> so you've had a crack at making a lager. Um, I have. Um, and it hasn't quite turned out the way in which you would like for it to work out. Yeah. Um, before you tell me what's in it, tell me yep. about your perception of it at the moment what 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 does it look like well show us what it looks like i think you got a name um, there yeah so. well it looks like that it's um still a little bit hazy because it's you know a gelatin in the keg and uh yeah it's still pouring some of the goo but um it's yeah it's just got this this real um like it's got a good sort of malt body to it but the problem is yeah it's just it's bland it doesn't have a lot of bitterness um, you know, and despite a not a huge hop addition, but you know, I would have thought it. it well, Beersmith reckons it's um, about fifteen IBU, right. um, which for for a beer with a final gravity of ten oh six, I thought that should be pretty pretty much enough to to get it through. Yep. And um, yeah, it just hasn't at all. So okay. So if I said to you that. Um, if I said if I said that that, that the, the beer without sort of I try not to suggest to people how their beers are smelling and tasting. Obviously, we're not in the same room at the moment, so it's a bit hard yeah. to tell. But uh, is the but would you would you say that the beer is flabby? Flabby? Um, yeah, lacks a bit lacks a bit of life and zing and yeah, yeah. It's just. There's nothing that makes me really sort of want to go back and have another, have another glass of it, yeah. Um, which is not ideal. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So um, tell me uh, what's in it. So just give me an idea of sort of the malt and the hops that you've got in it. And right. So the um, sort of thing. I'm just going to alt tab back across. Um, so the malt bill is 80% Gladfield Lager Light. Okay. Um, ten percent Carapils and ten percent Light Munich. Okay. Yep. And that's is it. it the Gladfield Carapils and Gladfield? Uh, oh yeah, Gladiator. Um, yep. Okay. So it's a hundred percent Gladfield. Yep. Um, malt. Okay. Oh, actually, no. It's sorry. It's Barrett Burst and Munich. Oh, Barrett Burst and Munich. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. So ten so percent of that, that line around. <laughs> 80%, so 80% lager malt, 10% Barrett Burst in Munich, and 10% Gladiator slash Carapils sort of yeah. thing. Okay. Um, what sort of hops went into it? Uh, hops were um, pearl and a little bit of citra right at the end of the boil. Okay. Uh, was pearl like a bittering addition? Uh, it was both. Um, it was in at 60 minutes and in at five minutes. 60 minutes and five minutes. And then a little bit of citra as well at the end, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And then okay. a sort of decent steep for about 20 minutes afterwards. Yep. Okay. Um, Post-boil. Okay. Um, what sort of yeast did you use? Uh, it was W3470. Um, yep. And so the Vine Stefan strain. And yep. Um, and so how, what was sort of the temperature regime um, that you threw at that work? 
Well, my fridge seems to be struggling with the temperature up here, as it turns out. Um, so I was I was shooting to ferment at sixteen, but I don't think it yeah. got below eighteen. Okay, so a little bit hot. Did did the beer come? Yeah. Uh, does the beer have any like banana ester or anything like no, that? No, no, no sort of weird esters or yeah. anything like that. Sixteen's apparently the right temperature for thirty four seventy. Yeah, that um, it's trying to go for that. So, yeah, so uh, that's the because when we because we did that thing a few weeks ago at the Fermenters yeah. Academy there, and I was saying, yeah, sixteen that ferments nice and clean. Yeah. Um, and so tell me um, about the water treatment in here, and, and I'll just sort of prefix for anyone who's watching this is that uh, Ryan's putting together these beers as pilot brews for a brewery that he is working on opening soon. So he's in that sort of recipe development mode and we're just talking through that process. So, uh, so yeah. So what sort of water chemistry or water you know, salts did you throw out this beer? Uh, so we had, um, had a fair bit of lactic just to bring the pH down. Um, and then it was, um, you know, so so this is for a, a forty liter batch. Yeah. Um, was three grams of Epsom salt, two grams of chloride, and one gram of sulfate. Like, like gypsum, calcium sulfate. Yeah. Yeah. How did you come to that conclusion for using those salts? Uh, honestly. Uh, beer smith um i went for a balanced lager profile and i put in the um the water report that i got from the from the local um water people yep which i have no idea if it's accurate or not but yeah um it's it's worked on most of the other beers i've done so yeah okay so um Judging by sort of everything that you've described there, um, there's 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 a few things that that we should probably address. Um, have you got like capacity to go and brew a couple of batches of lager to have a go at some things? Yeah, I do. I currently only have one one fermentation fridge, so yeah. it's um. Because the yeah, so basically going to need it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and it currently has a, a quake in there at the moment. So. All right, yeah. Well, that'll be done in two days, so that should be fine. But that so. should be done in a <laughs> day or two. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when when you're making lager, there's um, a few things that you sort of need to to think about. Okay. So when I think about a lager, and I know that we sort of talked offline about this, you were saying, oh, I don't have access to the big industrial processes and that sort of thing. And I also say to you, well, it's not really about that. I mean, the, the lager brewers, the mega, the, the yeah. multinationals and stuff like that have turned it into that process, but um, there's no reason that a craft brewer can't make a good Kraken decent lager. And there's a few little oh, yeah. tips, and tips that I sort of um, follow and what I'll do in this session is I'm going to give you a um, a Munich Hellers recipe. All right. Yep. It's just a straight up Munich Hellers. Just and just go and brew it. Okay. And yeah. and and that and what that will do is it's basically a tool for you to go and brew it, get a better understanding of the lager style, and yeah. then you can go and make your changes that you want to make and that sort of thing. Is that something you'd be willing to have a crack at? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, I've, I've, I've actually taken a bloody um, bronze at the AIBAs for a Hellas that I, yeah, right. um, last year, uh, okay. last year, year before. Um, it's, it's literally this specific recipe that's just gone completely sideways and I'm on the third yeah. brew of it now and it's, yeah, but I mean, it's that's not all working out. Melbourne. Yeah. But that's all been brewed in Melbourne. Um, yeah, which okay. has absolutely beautiful water. Okay. Um, so, yeah. so, um, so you're on the Gold Coast. So the, my next point was that water is probably one of the big things that's going to play heavily on, um, on, yeah. on that style of beer. And so, um, uh, and so I'm, I'm aware of some the, the water chemistry around there because I've got a couple of clients down. Um, on the Gold Coast, and they've had their water run through the lab. So, um, so basically, on the Gold Coast, you've got a really big des desalination plant uh, down at um, southern end of the Gold Coast. I think it's 
called Gatter or Tugan or something like that near the yeah, airport. Okay. And, um, and so the water from that, so they have this thing in southeast Queensland where they have this thing called the water grid. And so they can take okay. water from the D cell, they can take water from all the different dams around, uh, around southeast Queensland and they can mix it and match it and blend it. So right from all the way down on the border, uh, all the way up to Noosa is all yeah, on right. the water grid. And so Ooh. it changes <laughs> quite a lot. And so that's a pretty big uh, sort of thing, right? But yeah. chances are you're going to get the water that's put into the system closest to where you are. Okay? Makes sense. And so, so the first thing that I say with regards to water chemistry is um, uh, is firstly um, the water reports that you get from the council and or the water, your local water authority and that sort of thing they rarely they, they they're only a rough guide and they're really yeah. just there just so for them to say hey um, we're meeting the Australian water standard um, here's the rough idea of what's going in there and yeah, uh, and that sort of thing, and and it kind of r doesn't really tell you what's actually going into your brewery, um, yeah. and so so what it doesn't take into account is your street, your pipes, um, yeah. and um, uh, everything from where the water goes into the grid that we've got, and most cities have something pretty similar to it. You know, if you're in Europe, they recycle a lot of water. Um, yeah and uh, to, to how it winds up to you. So I suggest that to clients that they go and get their water tested from, from a sample from within their building because it actually takes into account the pipes in the street going up there. Case in point, yeah. I've got a client uh, who was having some um, metallic issues in their beer and uh, after some poking and prodding from the local water authority, uh, my client found out there was a 120-year-old cast iron water main going up his street. That little <laughs> flex, little flex of, of rust were coming off the inside of the pipe and winding up at random points uh, yeah. in his brewery and therefore in his beer. And so um, he's taken measures now to, to, to fix those things. But it just goes to show, um, you don't, because you, you can't see the, from, from where and to where, you know, you yeah. can't eyeball it, you don't know. And so the only way that you can actually eyeball it is to go and get your water analysed. Yeah. Um, the, the second thing is, um, is uh, I ignore, um, and this is, and I'll, I, I'll mention some things that are my sort of personal preference. I ignore um, water profiles from certain cities and I also ignore uh, the um, water profiles that Beersmith uses. Now, I use Beersmith to, to write recipes and stuff like that. Yeah. And I use another system called Beer 30 to actually track, do batch logging and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but when I'm actually writing beer recipes and doing water, I don't use Beersmith and I don't, and I use Bruin Water as my okay. tool. I'll, I'll, and I'll, and I'll, we'll, I'll share my screen with you in a second. We'll run through um, your, your beer um, yeah, recipe. And um, and what I do um, is Bruin Water is a great tool because it's put together by a guy called Martin Bruingard. And what he does is he's just a water guy. Um, I'd love yeah, to nice. meet him, but um, <laughs> um, but he just knows when it comes to water, he just knows his shit. And so this is no disrespect to Beersmith or anything like that. I love Beersmith. Yeah. Um, but, but I find that I get better outcomes by using Bruin Water. Uh, for water Makes chemistry. Sense. And so it, whether you're using brewing water or you're using beer smith or something like that, they always have their list of waters. They have Pills and Water and Dublin Water and, um, you know, Burton on Trent Water and all that sort yeah, of yeah. stuff. And all those things, as a modern craft brewer, I generally ignore. Do you know why I ignore yeah. them? It's because those brewers from those historical towns fucking hated their water. Yeah. And so what they did was they made beers to suit the water. Whereas nowadays with modern technology, we can actually understand what's in the water. We can manipulate it and be precise with our manipulations and actually make the water the way that we want to make it and make any style of beer that we want. Yeah, right? makes sense. So that's the beauty of it. Now, on the flip side, not everyone's got a bloody RO plant in their, uh, in their brewery. Not every 
brewer can afford that sort of thing. And for the most part, you know, in we're not a, we're not a bloody third world country, so um, yeah. you know you can your water is going to be generally okay. Yeah. So um, uh, so the best way to uh, to sort of approach that is. Um, make the rather than sort of focusing on targeting a certain um, like uh, uh, like a town that you want to replicate that water. Rather, what I use is is John Palmer's book. So, oh, shit. oh yeah, that book there. So I use John Palmer's book, and this is excellent. Okay, and I use this as my guide to for base. Uh, water store, the, how I manipulate the water. So yeah. I think it's page 150, 156 through to 159. Yep. And so in that book, have you got that book? It's pretty good. Uh, no, I don't, sadly. Yeah, okay. So uh, it's one of the element series. And so yeah. uh, in there is a table um, on uh, basically about. Um, be a colour, which is a big influencer on uh, your yep. water chemistry. Um, and also suggestions around the levels of calcium, sulphate and chloride. Because when it comes to manipulating your water chemistry for a certain style of beer, what's not yep. important is those historical old town things. Yeah. Um, what is important is the... Uh, alkalinity of your water not yep. the ph the alkalinity so the difference between ph and alkalinity is imagine imagine an old school radio dial right yep and ph is the station that you're trying to tune into and alkalinity is how fa how far or how hard you have to turn the dial to hit that station yeah okay so that's that's a different that's how i kind of visualize yeah. it Works for me. Might not work for you, but yeah, yeah, no, that makes I'm, a lot I'm of a, sense. <laughs> I'm a weirdo, um, and so, um, and so with a uh, with a lager, right? If I'm thinking about a lager, what I would, what I want, and what this book actually advises you to do is, you need around 50 ppm of calcium, yep. and that's for yeast flocculation. Sometimes you can get away with less. Um, sometimes you might need a bit more depending upon the yeast strain, that sort of thing, but let's just call it 50 and then yep. you can tweak it from there. And then you want to sulfate. So the other thing is, so, so the other thing is your sulfate to chloride ratio. Yeah. So there's two things in brewing water chemistry, which add up to beer flavor. It's only two numbers. And number one is beer pH. Yep. And number two is your sulfate to chloride ratio. Yeah. So beer, beer pH, not your work pH, not your water pH, beer, yeah. those in the finished product, the pH yeah. of your beer is the, is the number that, that represents the flavour of your beer. The reason why that's important is this, right? S things taste better when their pH is right where it needs to be. Yeah. So um, I like spaghetti bolognese. Do you like spaghetti bolognese? Yeah, love it. Rightio. Do you know how to make it? Yep. What's in it? Tomato, basil, oh, a bunch of herbs, a um, bit of meat usually, salt, That's pepper. It. Yeah. That's it. Tomato, meat, salt, pepper, some herbs, maybe yeah. some onions, something like that. It's really simple, right? Yeah. So when you go to the um, supermarket, right, and you go buy that tinned, Spaghetti bolognese sauce. Mm -hmm. You ever had that? Yeah, it's super acidic. Yeah, right. And there's not really much going on there, you know. No. Um, but you, as you said, you make spaghetti bolognese at home. I make spaghetti bolognese at home. I think I'm pretty fucking good at it too. Yeah. <laughs> and my spaghetti bolognese is pretty darn good, right? Yeah. But have you ever been to a really good, expensive Italian restaurant and had their spaghetti bolognese? Yep. And it's just. Ace. You can do the old yeah. chef's kiss. Ace. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah, right. just that extra little bit. So why is it that the tin for spaghetti bolognese sauce, the one that you make at home, and the one that, that, that Chef's Hat Chef makes, 
they're all made from the same ingredients. Yeah. Why does why does the why does the chef's spaghetti and bolognese taste better than the tin stuff when it's the same raw materials, more or less? Yeah. I mean, some of it's got to do with the quality of the raw materials that go in it, no doubt. But yeah. you know, but you know, you 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 had a good observation there. The stuff that's in the um, in the tin is usually super acidic, and it's just all about the acid. There's just not much yeah, going yeah. on there, and you can't can't taste the beef, can't taste the herbs. Yeah, it's just there just to make it shelf stable. Yeah, right. And so that comes back to why pH is so important. Is that depending upon the style of beer that you're making is dependent upon where the beer pH you want to land at. And I'll run through in a second yeah. with you how that works. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is the sulfate to chloride ratio. So when you have a beer that has more sulfate in it, it tends to taste, it accentuates hot bitterness yep. and hot flavor. Whereas you have, whereas you have, when you have chlorides, then that can accentuate sweetness. Some say yeah. malt. I don't like to say accentuates malt, but rather accentuates sweetness. Yeah. Um, and and so, because a lot of things, like you see a lot of things with home brewers, they go, oh, multi water profile versus hoppy water profile. It's not cut and dry like that. It's, yeah. It's just nuances and that sort of thing in it. And so that's, so they're the two flavor numbers. And that, when you're doing water chemistry, they're the ones that you've got to aim for. Yeah. Right. Okay, so when so when you're making a lager, all I'm thinking about is where the pH of the beer needs to land, and 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 what the sulfate to chloride ratio is, and also calcium, so that I get some yeast flocculation. So yeah. fifty ppm of calcium for yeast flocculation. Uh, what a beer pH of around for a lager of around four point one, four point two, yeah, right, somewhere around there. And then um, a sulfate to chloride ratio of 0.8, which means that there's a slightly more chloride than there is sulfate yep. to accentuate sweetness. When we're adding salts into a, into a beer, we only want to add the absolute minimum to get the job done. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's especially so when we're making a lager. Yeah. All right. So. Um, so. Let's apply that in reality, all right? So what I'll do is I'm gonna share my screen with you. You wanna get a water profile that's gonna closely match yours, because yep. if we do that, then um, we'll have a something that you can actually go and brew and be close enough, yeah. if you know what I mean? It's gonna be better yeah. than the council test. Yeah. And uh, oh, just so you so you know what I've got going on here, um, the beer smith profile I was going with was just um, yellow balance. Yellow balance, yeah, I know the one. Yeah. Does it actually say what? Um, oh, here we go. Got it. Got it. Got it. I've got one that's not far away from you. Nice. Okay. All right. So what I'll do is I'll just share my screen with you again. Yeah. So yeah. let's take a look at this uh, this water report here. Yeah. So you can see that on the screen there. Yep. Okay. So this is basically a water report here and I should be able to annotate it here, which is great. Uh, so the numbers that I'm looking at is when I look at a water report, um, I'm looking at the total hardness, which is basically they've got hardness, this one here. Yep. Right. Um, I'm looking at the res the there's total alkalinity, but what I'm actually interested in is residual alkalinity. Yes. So that's like that's that's basically so alkalinity is that how it resists change to pH when you're brewing and stuff like that. Yep. Um, and I'm also looking at the uh, sulfate and the chloride. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so if you have a look at this one here, you have 14 ppm of chloride, 7.7 .7 of sulfate. There really isn't a lot, but there's actually quite a lot of alkalinity. Um, yeah. it's not, it's not the biggest I've seen, but it's, but it's quite a bit. So we've got 33 residual alkalinity. Yep. Um, so, um, so what, what residual alkalinity is, um, 
it's a brewing specific number and it's yep. basically total alkalinity and total alkalinity less hardness and hardness yeah, okay. is calc calcium and magnesium and that's yep. how they, that's 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 the number that they come up with there and so um so what we can do is we can actually what i'll do is we can i'll pull up uh uh Brun, uh sorry. i'll pull up um uh Brewing water, and I'll just pop that in. So basically, uh, so for calcium, we've got 18. So I just punch in 18. Uh, magnesium is 2.3. Sodium. So we're basically doing the, all the ions and cations and anions. Yep. Sodium 16. M bicarbonate 50 let's call it 59 carbonate now you're not going to have carbonate in your water um so that's a really interesting one so you ever brewed a dark beer um many yes yeah okay so what do you do to adjust the ph in your dark beer uh usually just use a shitload of roasted malt yeah yeah, um, yeah. but what about water chemistry oh uh, water chemistry depends what i'm doing but um Again, I tend to go for a um, fairly chloride heavy. Um, yep. Do you ever use chalk? Um, sometimes. Uh, I haven't brewed a dark beer since I've moved up here. Um, but the, the water where I was in Ballarat um, didn't need it. it. You know, we were getting um, scale build up on the inside of the tanks just from the standard water. So yeah, I never right. needed to. So lots of people like to use chalk, chalk being calcium carbonate. Yep. And so and so carbonates don't don't dissolve in things less than a pH of eight point three. Yeah. Okay. What's your mash pH? It's in the fives. Five point four, five point three. So what's the point of putting something into your mash that doesn't dissolve? Yeah. So it's a buffer, right? So yeah. it pre prevents pH change, but it doesn't yeah. raise pH. Yeah, okay. So that's an interesting tidbit for you. Right, so so basically I've pump, pump, punched in all those water that water report from your area there. I'm going to send this to you later, mate. So, Cheers. Uh, so, you can, so you can get all that. So what I, the first thing I look at in brewing water is this number here. So basically that's, a di that's a, like a cation anion difference. So okay. anything below 0.5, anything below 1, and you're pretty much okay. Uh, yep. But we've got 0.26 here, which means we're, we're pretty good. I haven't bumped in potassium and nitrates and fluorides, but it's good yep. enough for now, right? Okay. Yep. So the next thing that we go and punch in is the grain bill. Yep. Give it a name. So if you can, can are you able to give me like the quantity in kilos of those yeah, yeah. different malts and the colours? Uh, yep. Um, hang on, just pull it back up. So it was Gladfield Lager. Yep, Gladfield Lager. Gladfield, and it was Gladfield uh, Gladiator. Gladiator. Yep. Um, and and uh, Barrett uh, Burst and Light Munich. Not Munich. Okay, so they're all base malts as far as brewing yeah. water is concerned. Yep. You can put in wheat notes and crystal malts, and even even though Glad Gladiator is kind of like a crystal malt, it's too pale to be considered yeah. a crystal malt. So yeah, yeah, they have rose malt and acid malt. We're not using any of those; they're all yeah. basically uh, base malts. Yeah, so anything Munich is base malt. So, yeah. uh, what do you got kilo wise? Uh, lager six kilos. Six, yeah. Gladiator. Uh, uh, Gladiator. Uh, 0 0.8 kilos. Eight. Yeah. And Maybe Munich, 0 0.8 kilos. Eight. Yeah. And what are the colour of those in EBC? The colour for the lager is 2.8. I'll call it 3, close enough. Yep. Um, the Gladiator, I've got 10. Sounds about right. And, and Munich is probably going to be about 17.7. 17. 17. Yep. 18, yeah. Beautiful. Okay. So the reason why we enter the colours and why they make a difference is, um, and so this kind of leads to dark beers versus pale beers, right? Yeah. Roasted malts, things that have gone through the Maillard reaction, yep. are more acidic. 
Yeah. Okay. And will lower the pH of your mash and your wort and that sort of thing. Right. So here's the really weird thing, right? Pale and pale beers will naturally mash and create wort, which is a high pH. Yeah. And beers with acid malt and roast malt will naturally are naturally acidic and will actually lower your pH. Yeah. But when it comes to actually making those beers taste good, you've got to flip it around the other way. So pale beers taste yeah. better with a lower pH, a lower beer pH. Remember, I was yeah. saying a beer pH is like your is a flavour yeah. number, and dark beers. Tastes better with a higher pH, right? So that so so with dark beers in particular, and I'm just going to shout out to Foghorn Sligo Extra Stout that I'm drinking at the moment, which is tasting fucking delicious. Um, is that so? You put yeah. a lot of a, a roast malt into a mash. It's going to acidify that mash, but it's not going to taste very good. So there's actually, so to give you their idea, so there's actually a process in chocolate making, it's called dutching. And so what dutching is, is that when they're actually roasting the cocoa beans, they actually do so in the presence of a, 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 co- a base, a caustic, like sodium hydroxide. They okay. raise the pH while they're roasting the, um, uh, the, the cocoa beans. And, that, and rather, than them, rather than the cocoa beans tasting burnt and acrid and astringent, they taste rich and full and chocolatey. Yeah, right. That's cool. Same for, it's the same for beer. Gotcha. So next time you're making a, uh, a dark beer, um, give us a shout. We'll do a, a water chemistry on a dark beer because it's very <laughs> different to what we're about to do. Okay. So the next thing that I need to know is mm-hmm. uh, water volumes. So what's your mash water volume and your sparge water volume and how much work are we making? Uh, so the mash water was 36 litres and sparge was 30 because that's as big as my own is. <laughs> so, uh, 36 mash liquor. Yep. Sparge is 30. Was there any dilute? Yep. Did you dilute your work down at all or anything like that? No. And that makes a 40 litre batch, yeah? Uh, but 40 litres in keg. Uh, it makes about 45 in the fermenter. 45. Right, so that's the next next important thing. So, first up, put in your base water report. Secondly, yep. um, stick in your grain bill with the colours that you get from the certificate of analysis, um, which your malt supplier will give to you. If your malt supplier doesn't send you a certificate of analysis with every shipment, find a new malt supplier. Yep. And then the third thing that you do is you stick in the um, the volumes. You need to be quite accurate with these because we're actually going to be treating all of the water. It's a really common mistake that I see with brewers. They treat the mash liquor, yeah. but there's more water that goes into the brewing process, right? Such as your sparge liquor, wort dilution, if you're doing yeah. high gravity brewing and stuff like that, right? And so, um, so yeah, that, that's, that's super important that you get an understanding and try and get that close because we're going to adjust it down here and we're going to do it yeah. in a grams per litre rate. Yeah. And so we need to be pretty right there, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Right. So lots going on on this screen, but what I'm looking at right here, I'm going to be looking at these things. So firstly, I'm going to be looking at this number here, right? Yep. The sulfate to chloride ratio. And I'm going to be looking at this one here. And then I'm going to be looking at this line along the bottom here, which is our finished water profile. Gotcha. Okay. What I'm not going to be looking at is this up the top. In fact, pretty much all of this here, I'm just going to fucking ignore. Yep. All right. So you see here, we've got our desired water profile, New England IPA. I'm not even going to touch it. All right? Yeah. Just going to bloody ignore it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> because we already know what we're aiming for. What we want um, is we want a... Uh, calcium of 50, right? Yep. We want a sulfate to chloride ratio of point, let's call it 0.8, and I want yep. a pH of 5.2 for our mash. Yep. Okay. Simple as that. Makes sense. They're the, they're, they're the only three things that I'm going to be looking at, right? So yep. let's... Uh, let's add in, let's let's get our calcium up to 50 to start with. So if I just... So we notice that our base water profile, we've already got 18. So we don't actually need to add too much salt because our, uh, yep. from our lab analysis, 
We know that we've already got 18. And we already yep. know that our sulfate to chloride ratio is 0.6. That's also pretty close. Our pH is way out. I'll come back to that. Yeah, so let's add in a little bit of... Um, let's add in a little bit of calcium sulfate. If I go 0.1... Right, see how it's come up to, see how the, the calcium has now come up to 41. Yep. But if you have a look here, so that's gypsum that I added in. So in your in your mash, or in your mash, yep. it's going to be 3.6 grams and 3 grams in the sparge. But yep. if you have a look at this number here, the spot sulfate to chloride ratio has gone to 4.5. Yeah, okay. That, that beer is going to taste not so great because yeah. it's going to be all about the sulfate and it's probably not going to... Be taste taste that good. I'm actually going to take your salts if you've got rec uh, records of that. We're going to punch this into yours, and we're going to yep. see what it actually is. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so that's actually not the right way to go, right? So adding in gypsum in this beer isn't the right way to go. Yeah, okay. So let's take that out. Let's add in some calcium chloride instead. Point one, right? Yeah. So what what's happened here is that's given us about the right amount of calcium but it's yep. dropped our sulfate to chloride ratio down to 0.1. So that's kind of not quite where we want to go either. Yeah. Right? So what we probably need here is a little bit of both to bring them up together. Yep. So if I change this to 0.05 and I change that to 0.05, we've got 48 ppm yep. of calcium and fuck, look at that. Bloody 0.8 sulfate to chloride ratio, right no. where we want it to be. <laughs> I did right. not plan that. <laughs> yeah. I did not plan that. So, <laughs> so that was just a bloody guess because normally what I do is I'm just adjusting those sorts of things. But if you have a look yeah. here, right? So if I went to 0.06, for instance, see how the sulfate to chloride ratio has now come up to 0.9? Yep. Right. So, it's, so, so, we're, so what we're doing now is we're just basically adjusting the flavour number. Yeah, the calcium changes a bit, but it's negligible. Yeah. 0.05, right? So 0.8. That's yeah. good. All right. We've got 48, 0.8. All right. That's yep. great. So that means that when next time you brew this beer, you want to put 1.8 grams of gypsum into the mash yep. and one and a half grams of gypsum into the boil. Okay. The reason why you put salts into the boil is you need to treat your sparge water and your dilution liquor. Yeah. Okay. So that definitely needs to go into... Um, uh, into the water, all of the water. Don't just treat your mash water, treat all yeah. your bloody water, right? Yeah. And obviously, because we've got the same rate of 0.05 grams per litre, the same amount of calcium chloride also goes into this beer. Yep. Right? What we haven't solved is the pH, the mash pH. As you can see, its estimate yes. is still rather high. Where did we want it to be? It was like 5.2 yeah. mash pH to be. Okay. So, how do you reckon we lower the pH without changing any of these minerals along this line here? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd just use lactic or phosphoric acid. <laughs> exactly. Some brewers, cool. <laughs> some brewers choose to use um, acidulated malt. Oh, yeah. Because that's the Reinhardt's Kabot way. And I have, I, I have a lot of respect for the Reinhardt's Kabot. But, what, but the thing is, is that when you add acidulated malt, it's very difficult to control the amount of lactic acid that goes into the mash. Yeah. Right? Because you just don't know. I mean, this thing will estimate it for you, but if you want precise control, you've got to use lactic acid or phosphoric acid. Yeah. Different acids taste different. Lactic acid, if you go do, it, do this at home, go get a glass of water or maybe some cordial or something like that and, and, and dose up some of it with... Um, lactic acid and dose up some water with phosphoric acid and go dose up some water with vinegar, which is acetic acid. And all those acids taste, taste different. And that actually makes your beer taste different. Really big influence. Yeah. So all I need to do now is I need to add lactic acid. I would suggest for you just to use lactic acid yeah. um, in this beer. Um, so lactic acid just to drop the pH to 5.2. So if I go 0.1 mils per litre, Let's drop it down to 5.48. Let's go 0 0.2, 5.18. Close enough. Nice. All right. So that means that you've got to add 7.2 mils of lactic acid into your mash. Yep. Now, what I say is, what I say to brewers is the first time you go and brew this, definitely add those salts in, right, to the mash and to the kettle, right? 
Yep. But the first time you brew uh, this beer with the acid, probably add about three quarters of that acid because this is like beer smith. This doesn't reflect reality. It's only theoretical. And the only yeah. way that you can get this right is to go and do it yourself. And the, and, and the pH is the thing that you've got control over. So put those salts yeah. in and put in three quarters of that lactic acid and then mix it up and check the pH. And if the pH isn't where you want it to be, if it's still too high, add a little bit more. Once yep. the acid goes in, obviously you can't take it out. So um, you're basically, um, you're stuck with it. So um, so um, that's that's kind of important there, that you don't put too much acid in. Yep. And so the first time you brew this, if you're plus or minus a pH of 0.1, good enough the first time. Dial yep. it in the next time you make the beer. Okay. So if you have a look here, right? So this, this, this column here is your um, mineral additions for the mash and this is for your sparge liquor. And you'll see here, that, that, and what a lot of people forget is they forget about the putting acid into their sparge. Yeah, of course. In your, uh, so this basically says 1.8 mils of lactic acid in your sparge, but I don't do that, right? Yeah. So. I'll swing back around about the, the effect of pH in different parts of the brewing process in a second. But when you're making a lager, right, what you want to do is uh, you want to add your salts in at the start of the boil. Yep. So, so your, kettle, your kettle salts or your sparge salts, chuck them in the kettle at the start of the boil. And yep. you want to, and, and 10 minutes before the end, you want to take a pH reading of your work. Yep. And then, um, and then what you want to do is you want to actually acidify your work down to somewhere between 4.9 and 5. Lots yeah. of brewers don't do this, right? You can acidify your sparge water. That's totally cool. Uh, but this is a really easy way to do it. Now, the reason why we do that with 10 minutes to go is we actually want the work to have a higher pH throughout the boil because having a higher pH deals with DMS. Yeah, okay. If, you, if your work pH is above 5.4, you're not going to have a DMS issue. I don't know what Gladfield mold is like. I, I, I admit that I haven't used it as much as I would like to. Um, but I know I like to use uh, Wyman Premium Pilsner malt, which is their extra pale malt. And it's got a yeah. lot of DMS precursor in it. And you need to make sure that during the boil that your work pH in the, in the boil is up around the 5.4 mark because that actually deals, it stops DMS dead in its tracks. Yeah, that makes in, sense. In, in addition to a long boil as well. Yeah. Okay. So those two things together deal with DMS. Last 10 minutes of the boil, all your DMS is going to be gone, right? So you can actually make that pH adjustment. You've got 10 minutes to do that, right? So what you want to do is you want to put lactic acid into the kettle, recheck yep. the pH and get the pH somewhere between 4.9 and 5. Yeah, okay. That's... And so what's going to happen there is that's going to be, that's your, that's your flavor addition. That's going to bring the beer pH down to make it land right where it's going to taste fucking amazing. Yeah. Okay. So if you think about it this way, it goes like this. So if I go, just going to bring up a little bit of a whiteboardy sort of thing here. Yeah. So can you see like a whiteboard looking thing there? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a chart. So I've got a chart, right? Yeah. And so on this side of the, of the x axis, axis is going to be the uh, uh, b b b stage of production, right? And on this side, it's going to be pH. Okay. Yeah. So when you start brewing, right, the mm -hmm. first part, right, of your, I'm going to change that color, uh, is, I'm going to change it to red. So the first part is your water. Yeah. Right? And your water, according to that water report that we had, I think it said that it was, the water pH was 7.7. .7. Yeah. So here's 7.7. .7. Look at my childish writing. <laughs> where, when we when we mix that with grist, where does our pH usually wind up? 
uh, high fives usually, I reckon. High fives, exactly. So we're going to drop down and we've got mash. Mash, five-ish. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. All right, so we've got five-ish, all right? Yeah. And so what are we doing at the last 10 minutes of the boil? We're doing a pH adjustment. Yeah, it's, to bring it down to 4.9. So we're going to do a little bit of a pH adjustment. We're going to do the here, and this is going to be I'm going to go back to text because I'm going to be 4.9. Oh, right. So that's our work, right? So yeah. back to work. I should get a pen. Look at that. <laughs> right, so what happens during fermentation? Generally drops down a bit more, usually ends up around 4.2-ish for most beers. Right. So the yeast actually excrete an acid just as part of um, fermentation. It's like citric yeah. acid and all sorts of different acids and that sort of thing, right? So your pH drops again right to here. So I'm going to write a B. That's beer, yeah. right? And so what that is is where our product winds up, right? Yeah. Right here at, uh, you know, let's call it 4 point, I'm gonna call it 4.1-ish. Sure. Okay. All right. So this number here is our target. And if, yeah. we wanna, if we wanna hit that number as our, you need to have a plan for your target pH for your beer, this is the flavor number, all right? Yep. And so I'm just going to write flavor right here. And so that's our flavor number, right? Yep. If we're aiming for this number here, along here, then we need to reverse engineer it back up to the start of fermentation here. So if you brew this beer, and the yeast make it land in a little bit too high, well, that means yeah. that you need to bring the work pH down a little bit just, yeah, to make it, just to make it land right on your target like that. Makes sense. Makes sense? Yeah. And so the beauty of it is your work, right? Yeah. Your work at 10 minutes to go in the kettle, you have absolute control over the pH of the Yeah, beer. of course. Right, so that's the point at 10 minutes where you do that acidity adjustment of your work to make sure that the yeast yeah. do the rest of the job and carry the beer all the way down to your target flavour number. Yeah, nice. Pretty cool, hey? It is. <laughs> pretty cool. So that's kind of how it works, right? So that's pretty much your, your brew day and how you actually get your... Um, beer to hit that target pH. And and so if yeah. making a lager, I would want that beer to drop at around 4.1, 4.2. Yeah. Okay. Up to you. It's a flavour number and I'm not here to tell you how to make the, your flavours in your beer. That's entirely up to yeah. you. But there's a, a range there. If I was making a beer that was a slightly darker, maybe an amber or something like that, my target yeah. would be around the sort of, uh, 4.3 ish, 4.4 ish mark. And if I'm making yep. dark beer, what I'd want is for my beer to land at around 4.5. Yeah, okay. 4.6, right? Because yeah. that higher pH makes those uh, roasty notes um, come across more rich and rounded and chocolatey. Yeah. Except if you're making a dry Irish stout, in which case you do want to acidify it because they're dry and that's yeah, yeah. So that's a whole different thing. But for the sake of a lager, that's how yeah. it works. Yeah, cool. All right. So, so in your so in your case, right? Really, yeah. really simple. Um, is basically one point eight grams of gypsum in the mash, one point five in the boil, one point eight grams of calcium chloride in the mash, uh, one point yeah. five in the boil. Somewhere around 7.2 milliliters to get you to a mash pH of 5.1. Then yep. ignore this number here, the 1.79, and just add in 10 minutes to go, whatever acid it takes to get it to somewhere around 4.9 or 5. Yeah. 
The next thing I yeah. would say to you is if you can, I, I've, I've had, I, I'm, I've never gotten 3470 to work well for me. It comes across to S3 for me. Yeah, okay. I've had better success with S189, Swiss Lager Yeast. Yep. That's just my personal opinion. You probably, if you've had good experience, good, good um, outcomes with 3470, use it. But what I usually, what I usually do is uh, S189, picture it at say 11 or 12 degrees, hold it at 11 or 12 degrees till it gets to six Play-Doh, that's 1025. Yep. Then set the tank to 18 and let it rip. Yep. It'll never get to 18, but that just, just goes up just to hit diastole yeah, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, and I find S189 a lot cleaner um, and provided you've got good yeast health, and as we saw at the Fermenters Academy the other week, yeah, you don't yeah. need to oxygenate your bloody work for yeah. dry, and you can put dry yeast straight in the... Yeah, which it's fantastic. Just, Turns out I've been doing it right for years. <laughs> mind blown, mind blown. Yeah. Thank you, Fermenters, for that information. And yeah. um, and so, and, and you wind up with a beer that should ferment out in about 10 days. Yeah. And if yeast health is good, that S189 will actually flock out really well and you can have a lager in three weeks. Yeah, nice. Same as what you would have for a, some sort of American pale ale, you know, with USO5 or tension yeah, yeah. or some sort of American ale yeast, that sort of thing. So, so you don't need to, like, you can and, yeah, you get some nice flavour outcomes you know, when yeah. you lager, you, you beer for weeks and weeks and weeks and that sort of thing. And I totally agree with that. But when you balance up the commercial realities of running a, a brewery, a commercial brewery, yeah, uh, the production schedule and the sales team are usually going to be cracking the whip going, yeah. fuck, you need to pull your finger out, Ryan. But yeah, even no, no, lager, it tastes so good. We're, it tastes so good. <laughs> we're selling out of it. Please make yeah. more. So, yeah. So that's pretty much it. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's just, and so, so basically what it is when you're making lager is you just got to be attentive to your, um, um, your raw materials. Good malt makes good lager. So yeah. basically that same process, if you did 100% Wyman Pilsner or Wyman Premium Pilsner malt, yep. um, and then you did a bittering addition, 15 to 20 IBUs of uh, Magnum or Hercules, which is the yep. new version of Magnum in okay. Germany. Um, 15, 20 IBUs, somewhere around there, and do that same work pH and water chemistry and all that sort of stuff, which is not going to be different at all. Um, and same yeast and all that sort of stuff. You want, That's totally decent beer. It's super simple in terms of its recipe formulation. Yeah, nice. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, that's, that's pretty well. It. But the good thing is now you've got the kind of the tools now that you can go and make that beer. You can make your recipe formulation changes. You want to throw the citra in the whirlpool or late and that sort of thing. Go for yeah. it. See what happens. And I think you'll have a wildly different beer and I will come down and try it. I would imagine. <laughs> I will, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Did oh, you have any questions it. there about that? Um, no, nah, not really. Uh, oh, well, actually, one thing about the um, the salt additions. Yes. Um, can you just chuck all of the salt in the mash? Uh, yes, you can. Yeah, cool. So let me, let me show you. So brewing water will actually take that into account. Yep. So there's a little... So brewing water, right? So... Um, there's a free version, um, yep. but I would recommend going and flicking Martin Brungard, um, 10 bucks US yep. for the paid version. The reason why is it has this little tab down the bottom called the data manager. So we've okay. just done this beer and I just go save and it's just saved it. Yeah. And, um, if I ever want to reload it, then I can go and select it from the drop down here and go and reload it. And that's, sort of oh, thing. that's nice. So, yeah. Right, so so you don't need so the reason why I use um, the paid version is you don't need a different spreadsheet file for every yeah. single version of the thing you do. It's all in the one place. Yeah, sweet. It's very good and ten bucks, mate. Yeah, kid amongst it. How could you not? Yeah. So there's a setting here that says add sparging water mineral additions to the mash. 
Yeah. Now, what's going to happen when we select this? It goes yes or no. Mm. It, calcium, uh, gypsum, and calcium chloride will lower the pH of of the the um yeah the mash. Okay. Yeah. Um. So by adding all of the minerals into the mash, then yeah. it's going to affect. It's going to lower this pH. So if I go do that now, right? Watch the uh, estimated mash pH number. All right. See how it's dropped to yeah, five point okay. oh nine. Yep. Okay. So what would you do there in that situation? Uh, take out some of the lactic. Correct. Exactly. So basically, what you would do is I go point one eight. Oops, sorry. Point one six. There we go. Yeah. So take out some of the lactic acid, and it's not much. And yeah. you can add all of the minerals into the mash and be done with it. Yeah. Nice. So either way you want to play it, and the beauty of it is, right? So if I go here, I'll go. Right, so you can actually, so, I can, so when you, this is where you change the name of it, right? Yep. So I can hit save, and so you see, you see it's saved a version with all yeah. the salts in mesh. Yeah, so you nice. can actually keep, keep both, try both, and whatever works for you, uh, you've got a record of it. Yeah, cool. So, yes, you can totally do that. Yeah, sweet, because that's totally, what I've been doing totally for years. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah. It's it's up to you. I, I prefer to do some of the salts in the um, in the mash and then throw salts into the kettle during the boil. Yep. Um, that is entirely up to you. Yeah, cool. Not nice. bad, eh? Yeah. Go brew yeah. this after your quite's done tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and, I mean, um, I, I pitched, I pitched the yeast on on um, Saturday, so it's it's. I'm pretty sure it's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah. And so just basically try that and see where it lands. There won't be yeah, a lot right. of hops in this beer, even though you've got that late edition pearl and citra in there. Mm. There wouldn't be much hops in that beer at all. So no, nah, it's not a lot. You know, if you're aiming for sort of 16 to 20 sort of IBUs or something like that, then... Yeah, where are we? Total hops. Yeah, it's like 65 grams in total. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love New Zealand pills. Have you ever had a New Zealand pills now? Yeah. yeah I've, I mean, I've, I think I've only had the, the Max one. Oh, which is nice. It's good. I just love New Zealand Pilsner, you know, that's been a lot of late New Zealand hops and they dry hop them yeah. as well. And, um, you know, they taste the way they taste, again, because they've got the pH and, you know, the acidity adjustments right yeah. and just brings out those beautiful New Zealand diesel burnt rubber car tyre and, and <laughs> sort of gooseberry fucking notes if you do it. Nelson, yeah. Nelson saw and uh, It's one of my favourite styles of beer. So. Yeah. Does. So, yeah. So there you go. Nice one. Thanks heaps, man. That yeah, was a lot of you, fun. Man. Did you enjoy that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah she went right. Really <laughs> awesome. Uh, there's lots there. No matter what lager style you're making, those same tips will just bloody work. Yeah. But the thing, because what I think you've probably been sounds like you've been missing is I just, I definitely think water. Sound, the recipe sounds alright, mate. You know? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a, it's just a beer, beer, you know. And yeah, like that's the thing. It's you know, it's a, it's a lager that's got to be drinkable by tourists in Surfers Paradise. So I'm not trying to go yeah. hard, you know. It's it, it sounds like as well that you've got like with 10 percent gladiator in there. Are you trying to put some body into it, or what are you trying to? Do? Uh, yeah, a bit of body and head retention. Um, ah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because that was the the big thing. Like the the a couple of the previous batches that had none of that. Like because I was using some of their um, malted maize as well, uh, yes. which I got rid of completely because I don't like the taste of it. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no, it was just like it'd be this lovely sparkly fizzy beer, but no head at all. Um, yeah. So. Do you wanna you want a hot tip on how you can just hundred percent fix your head retention? Hmm. 90% of the time it's glassware and bar yep. staff and not having clean glasses. Yep. Uh, but from a brewer's perspective, um, if you take four IBUs out of that recipe and then put four IBUs in as Tetra Hop in the bright tank or right before you keg it, 
Yeah, okay. Job done. Nice. Yeah, I mean, Jesus, it's only bloody 15 OBU anyway. So. Exactly. Yeah. So Tetra Hop is, does, is fucking amazing for head retention. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And Actually, you only yeah, need, somewhere else as well. Yeah, you only need four IBU. So I just did a I, I just did a corner keg and um and 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 of a of a pale ale and yeah. I chucked four IBUs of Tetra Hop in and corny keg was uh zero point nine milliliters of yeah. Tetra Hop. Yeah. And that just fucking fixed it. Yeah, nice. It was amazing. Yeah. Actually maybe I should do that to the other keg of this. <laughs> Well, you can do an experiment with it, you know. Tetra yeah. cheap. Just go get it from a tiny. It's like fucking 40 bucks for a litre drum of it. Yeah. Yeah. I've, got <laughs> it for, I've got it for home brewing. It's going to last me five years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I got a sample of bloody, um, a, a one litre sample of uh, Biofine. And I'm like, well, that's about 400 batches worth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now there's some good stuff there. So, yeah. yeah. Nice. I'll make some lager. I'd love yes. to come and try it. Easy. Cheers. And I um I hope that helped, mate. And then that was just yeah, did. a lot of fun. And when everybody's going to be the, the reason why we did this today is I just wanted to do because lots of people are going to be stuck in isolation over yep. the next few days. And I think that it's yeah, let's just spend this time and connect with each other and make some awesome awesome beer. Yeah, for sure. And, all, all, and when we when we get back out and when the punters get back out again, um, you know, when this is all over and um, um, we're all back making beer, let's make our beer even fucking better. That's what I look forward to. Well, that's it. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, why not make better beer? Yeah, exactly. All right. Let me know how you go, mate. Reach out when um, when that beer is done. Yeah, shall do, man. Thanks, Hayes. And, and let me know if there's a, there's a difference there. If it, and if it's all, also, if it's shit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> if it's shit, I'll fucking mail you one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. No worries. All right. You have a good one. I'll talk to you soon, eh? No, you too, man. Thanks, heaps. Cheers, mate. See ya. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>